welcome to University Baptist Church. I'm so glad that you've joined us for worship this morning. You know, we recognize that you could be doing anything right now, but we're happy to have you with us. Even though we're not together in person, you're joining us through this wonderful virtual means, and that means that we're together worshiping. And so we appreciate you, we're glad you're here, and we want you to feel like you're a part of this church. You know, being a part of this family of faith isn't just something we do and you receive. You get the opportunity to join with us. And you can do that by supporting the ministries. One way is financially supporting it. No gift is too small, and we appreciate everyone, whether they give or not. But another way is to find ways you can serve. And there are ways to get involved, no matter who you are or what your gifts are. We have lots ways for you to plug in, get involved, and that's how you get to know other people and get to feel like you're really a part of this, this family. So if you'd like to get involved in these in the ministries of the church, we invite you to reach out and get in touch with us. You can email me, matt at universitybaptist.org, or you can call the church office. Thank you for joining us for worship, and I hope that during this hour, you feel God's presence and grow in your faith. The Lord be with you. We are in that post-Easter season, uh, what some in church work call Associate Minister Sunday, when often the senior minister is gone the Sunday after Easter. And somebody asked me this past week, are you going to be gone? And I said, no, because I've been so looking forward to April, because we are going to do a four-part series on Obadiah. In my notes, it says, pause for applause. Um, but I'm really excited because this minor prophet has so much to teach us. And so over the next four Sundays, we're going to soak in these uh, 291 words, the 21 verses. And we're really going to get to know how this prophet can teach us about how to live for Christ today. How to let our light shine. How to live for God's justice and so as we begin our time of worship today, don't let the scripture passage lead you astray. Focus your attention, open your hearts, and prepare your minds to experience God during this time of worship.
Please join me in the call to worship. How good it is for us to come together as kindred spirits. Hallelujah. Our doubts are answered, and we feel the presence of Christ. The risen Christ speaks to us and gives us peace. Hallelujah. Let our worship be the sign of our belief. Please pray with me. Dear God, with your power, nothing is impossible. With spirit raised and hearts trusting, we are grateful for your promise that when two or more are gathered, you are there among them. We thank you for the opportunity to gather in your holy presence once more, O oh Lord. We ask that you would bless our worship service today. We pray that you would help us have a yearning heart and an open ear so that we may thirst for your word and manifest your glory today. This we ask in the holy name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. How is everyone this beautiful morning? The sky was a gorgeous blue today as I drove in. It was absolutely fabulous. Welcome to University Baptist Church. University Baptist Church is an open, welcoming, and affirming community, believing that everyone has something to offer. And we are just so glad that you are here with us today, whether you're worshiping here in the sanctuary or watching on YouTube. Now, if you take the t time right now to find those red booklets that are on either end of the aisle, we would love to have a record of your presence with us today. Um, if you are new to UBC, please enter some information because we would love to get in contact with you and give you even more info about this community of faith and how you can be a part of it. At UBC, we don't pass the offering plate, but we do have ways that you can donate to our church. There are offering boxes in the back of the sanctuary, and there's also codes on the pew cards and in your bulletin 
um, so that you can give online or you can just send your check to the church office. A couple of announcements. We do have uh, some need for some people to get involved in children's church. Um, so if you would like to work with these wonderful young people that are sitting down here, maybe one Sunday, give of your time to do that. That would be wonderful. Please see Melanie Tennant if you are interested in helping out. Also, we'd like to invite you to our continuing Growing Young study. Even if you haven't been there before, it's still your chance to grow a little younger if you uh, would like to do that um, every Wednesday at 6 o'clock. But you really ought to be here by 5.30 and have a wonderful, delicious meal by our chef, Owen Reed. So please um, try to make a reservation if you can. It's okay if we add you at the end but we'd love to know that you're coming so that he has a more accurate count. And there's a way that you can do that online. If you're not sure how to do that online, see me after the worship service. I will stick around and show you how easy it is to do that. Now let's worship together. Good morning. Today's gospel lesson is from Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life and what you will eat and what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Let the birds in the air, look at the birds in the air, they neither sow nor reap <clears throat> nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are they not of more value than you? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour of span to your life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies in the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, Will he not clothe you, you have little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be given as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today is trouble. Today's trouble is enough for today. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
morning, friends. It is so good to see you. What do I have in my hand? A balloon. What do you like to do with balloons? Giddy up. Giddy up. What, like pop them up in the air? Yeah, so oh. it can stay in. So it can stay up in the air? Kitty uppy. Kitty uppy. Y'all are gonna have to, we're going to have to meet after church today, and y'all have to show me how to do that. It's a game where you have to hit the balloon and make it stay there, and it can't touch the ground. Oh. It's, like it's kind of like playing lava. It, it's called Oh. That sounds like a lot of fun. Um, a balloon can bring lots of happiness, but sometimes it can bring surprise and maybe disappointment. How many of you have balloons for your birthday and like a few days later, that balloon just kind of has wilted? Oh, yeah, especially if it's helium, it blows away and up into the air, yeah. You and I sometimes are like a balloon. We sometimes get all puffed up and think we're better than other people. I don't know if I can do this. Sometimes we may think that we're better than other people, and we expect everyone to think that too. Maybe we think we're smarter than the other kids in our class. Or maybe we think no one is as good as us in sports. Or perhaps we think we are better singer than anyone. You're scared, aren't you? Sooner or later, those of us who get puffed up thinking we're better than others, something will happen to our balloon. Right? And it just deflates, and thank you very much, it just deflates, and then then it's not our balloon anymore, and we're not puffed up anymore. In Luke chapter 14, verse 11, it says, everyone who makes himself great will be made humble, but the person who makes that person humble will be made great. The Bible teaches us not to be too proud and to think we're better than other people, Jesus says, we are to be humble and realize that when we're good at something, it's because God has strengthened us. From now on, when you see a balloon, I hope it will remind you that we should not become too puffed up and think we're better than other people. Can we pray? Okay. Jesus, help us to be humble and not think we are better than other people. Remind us that whatever abilities we have are a gift from you and that you are the one who deserves the praise. Amen. All right, girls. I invite you to pray with me. Living Lord, on this Sunday after Easter, we know it's more than eggs and lilies. It's about a power and a presence let loose on the world to change our very lives. Help us to get in the way of that power and presence now and be transformed by your Spirit. You are the God who has declared your love for the poor, the broken, the diseased, and the hungry of the world. You are the God of our loved ones who have gone before us in death and are even now gathered about your throne in eternity. And you are the God who has called us, the people within this sanctuary, to be your servants and stewards and witnesses. We ask your forgiveness, Lord, for the many ways we have failed you. 
by being selfish, by seeking our own way, and by ignoring your commandments and your call upon us. Revive us and restore us to your service, we pray. Bless now our offerings of love, that the good news of Easter may be proclaimed everywhere. Empower us to live as Easter people, to restore health and wholeness and order to a world you so deeply love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Old Testament lesson is from Obadiah verses 1 through 4. The vision of Obadiah. This is what the sovereign Lord says about Edom. We have heard a message from the Lord. An envoy was sent to the nations to say, rise and let us go against her for battle. See, I will make you small among the nations. You will be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rocks and make your home on the heights, you who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Lily. This reading from Obadiah you say in your heart, who can bring me down? And though you soar aloft like an evil, from there the Lord will be bringing you down. It's, uh, we're studying Obadiah and the Bible study that I lead in the parlor each week for the next four weeks. And so one of the things about this book that is so helpful is we can read it all in its entirety in about four minutes. Now, we're not going to do that right now, but I want to invite you to do that because then do it later. Do it this week. As you get to know this book and as you get familiar with it, you get to see the holistic big picture message in this prophecy as it's speaking to us for today. Now, we, as I mentioned earlier, are beginning our four-part series on this minor prophet, and you may have been wondering since the opening word of worship, why? If you're honest, you've been wondering that. Um, there are two reasons. First, this summer, on August 21st, I will be celebrating 20 years in gospel ministry. And so as I looked ahead to this anniversary of my ministry, I went back and looked at my sermon files. And I found there were three books in the Bible that I had never addressed from a pulpit anywhere. Obadiah being one of them, and we're going to remedy that situation over the next few weeks. The other two are Second John and Jude. Watch for them in the coming months, so that before the conclusion of my second decade in ministry, we will have touched every one of the books in the Bible, and some not in the Bible, in fact. But the second, and, and the much more important reason, the significant reason, 
why we would take our time on this little book, these 21 verses, is because it is so rich. It has so much to say for, to us today. It has lessons about pride, and Susan talked about that in the children's sermon. It talks about how we treat other people. It addresses God's consistency and also God's activity throughout history. It's a short book, so we can read it in its entirety and really get to appreciate its message from start to finish. We can move between the poetry of the first 18 verses to the prose of the last three. And the more we read it, the more it can become a part of the lexicon of our faith. Will you bow your heads with me? Merciful maker of all things, you hear the prayers of our hearts. You listen as we walk into this space, carrying with us the burden of a week, whatever kind of week it has been. You know our ups and you know our downs, and you are with us through each step on our journey. God, you love us. You lift us up. You give us moments of correction and set us on the path to your righteousness. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Family conflicts are such an unpleasant affair. I've been really lucky in my family of origin. We just, we don't have, we don't have serious conflicts. We don't have things where people stop speaking to each other. But when I widen my own lens and I include the family of faith in this picture and start thinking about conflicts, there's way too many. In my first church, our congregation was a member of the local Baptist Association, and it was just after the Southern Baptists had passed a, a new version of their faith and message, their statement of belief, which was approved in the year 2000. And so some of the local pastors moved that this become the defining document for all the Baptist churches in our association. My church didn't belong to the Southern Baptist Convention. It was, as we are, part of the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. And so I had to look up this, this document, the faith and message. And I was brand new. The ink on my ordination was barely dry. And I didn't know, well, I didn't know anything, if I'm being honest. Um, I, I knew things about unrelated stuff, but about being a pastor, I, I'd like to think I've learned a little since then, but every so often I have a reminder that I still know so little. But at the time, I didn't know what to do, so I, I wrote an open letter to all of the pastors in our association, suggesting that instead of making a document that really didn't have anything to do with all of us, that we, we center around something like sharing God's grace and love with our community. That didn't seem controversial to me at the time. <laughs> Whoever laughed. <laughs> oh, how naive I was. <laughs> Some of these other pastors summoned me to a meeting. Christ followers have a long history of conflict. It goes back before the fundamentalist takeover of the Southern Baptist Convention in 1979. Back in 1845, Baptists in the United States found another issue to split over. It was slavery at the time. And if we go back in our own tradition, in the 17th century, the uh, general and particular Baptists in England decided they should split as well. There's a pattern forming here. Thomas Helwes and John Smythe, the very first English separatists who left persecution in England to go to the religious freedom in Leiden, got there and with their 41 followers decided to baptize themselves and the people who were following this new kind of practice of faith and then split up. You know, it, it's not just our tradition, though. It's not just Baptist. Every single Protestant tradition has a history filled with conflict, disagreement, splits. And there's no need to proffer a list of other churches' dirty laundry 
I, as I was writing this, my mind started filling with all of the news of different churches, and you cannot name one that has not had some sort of a split. Going back even further in 1517, that's when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses on the door at the cathedral in Wittenberg, which led to the Protestant Reformation. If we go back a little further into the 11th century, we find the East-West schism, the great schism between the Orthodox, Church, Orthodox churches of the East and the Catholic churches of the West. We can go back, but I think you get the point. Any conflict is unpleasant, whether great conflicts of the church or world conflicts in politics or even individual personal conflicts with other people. And in our reading today in Obadiah, we step smack dab in the middle of a conflict. A conflict that had been going on for generations. A conflict that traces its history back to Genesis 16 when God chose a people to be the light among the nations and said, Abraham, well, Father Abraham had many sons. That's kind of how Genesis 16 goes, although they didn't have notation in the Hebrew. But when God chose Abraham, Abraham's son Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau, and it's Jacob and Esau's conflict that we get to in Obadiah. They, of course, had a tumultuous relationship. We can trace it through Genesis from chapter 25 when the twins were born, Esau coming first with Jacob holding his brother's heel. We have Jacob tricking his brother out of his birthright, tricking his father out of his blessing, and going on while wrestling with some heavenly being in Genesis 32, Jacob received the name Israel. Meanwhile, in Genesis 36, Esau became Edom. And now it gets more familiar because we have in Obadiah the conflict between the Israelites and the Edomites. This back and forth continued for generations. And if we fast forward to the year 586 or 7, before the Common Era, before the time of Christ, we find Jerusalem under siege. The Babylonians had shown up and said, hey, we want what you got. We're going to take it. And so they surrounded Jerusalem. Edom took advantage of the situation. And this is the context out of which the prophet Obadiah comes. One of the central themes in this short book goes around this issue of divine justice. According to Obadiah, God sees the plight of people, all people. There's a shift, and we'll get to it a little after our reading today, but it goes from the particular of the conflict between the Edomites and the Israelites to all nations. Read the book this week. It takes four minutes. Read it in its entirety. Read it so it becomes familiar. Read it so that you know what it is telling you. God sees when neighbors ignore the suffering of their neighbors and do nothing to help. God sees. God is here. God is present. And that's what Obadiah wants people to hear. Obadiah begs for an answer to the question, what, what did Edom do when Israel was in trouble? What did the people of Esau do when the people of his brother Jacob were in trouble. Were, were, they, were they too proud, too self-absorbed, too focused on what was happening with them to get involved? As we ask these questions of the text and try to get to know it better, we have to ask the same questions of ourselves and the conflicts that we see around us, the conflicts in which we're involved, the conflicts that involve our family of faith, that involve the world around us. The Edomites were, were proud in the worst sense of the word. They thought they were better than the Israelites. They thought they deserved to be safe while the Babylonians kicked around the Israelites. Now, now pride can have good characteristics. I, I'm so proud of so many things. I, we were talking about this passage in Bible study, and we have uh, 
four of our university students in our Bible study, and we talked about how we're proud of them and the accomplishments to our fourth year students who are about to graduate and go off into the world. And, I, and I'm not their parent, but man, I'm proud of them. I look at all the things they've done over the four years we've gotten to know them. We look around at the accomplishments of the people we love and we just, we feel good. Pride in that sense can be a good thing, but that's not what the Edomites were feeling. That's not what they saw when the Babylonians came marching over the horizon toward Jerusalem. The Edomites felt something more like schadenfreude. They were okay with the Babylonians conquering the Israelites. As a matter of fact, they may have been, been pretty good, felt pretty good about it. Thank God it's them and not us. Obviously not us, because we're better than them. J.R. Bartlett writes, there's no evidence that Edom gave former military help to Babylon, but Edom didn't oppose Babylon either. And most likely, after all was said and done between the siege on Jerusalem and the Babylonians' invasion of Jerusalem, Edom remained intact. In other words, when the Babylonians came, the Edomites were at best unaffected, but more likely benefited. This conflict is the backdrop. And the book begins with Obadiah as God's messenger addressing Edom. The prophecy opens by saying that God will take up the cause of the suffering Israelites and bring about justice for an oppressed people. Sam Pagan writes, Obadiah's prophecy challenges believers to address real problems. Think about that. We, we flip right by this book. I don't know if any of you were looking in the Pew Bibles when uh, Lily was reading, but because it's tucked away in the 12 minor prophets, it's easy to flip right back and forth by it and keep missing it. But Sam Pagan says that if we read this, if we take it seriously, if we drink these words in, we're going to see a challenge to address real problems. And these, he lists out racism, the oppression of socially excluded groups, such as minorities and unhoused people. When, when you put it that way, it has something to say to us today. The language can feel ancient and removed from us and our experience. The, the place names can be unfamiliar and send us scurrying to the dictionary or, or Google. But if we consider it as a message about prideful acts and family conflict, we can start to see how it has something to say to us right now. For example, a Nigerian theologian named Joel Baiwul compares the similarities between the text of Obadiah and the situation he sees every single day in Nigeria. He explores the political, economic, ethnic, and religious contexts of conflict and hostility. And he likens the divine scandal of Jacob and Esau with parental favoritism and generational hostility in his context. Think about that. He's reading Obadiah. Now he is a biblical scholar and he is a theologian, but he's reading this and he's seeing what's happening in his own context. In Nigeria, he sees something parallel in the legacy of British colonialism and the Muslim Hasua Fulani political manipulative, manipulative dominion. And that's just one example of how one scholar can read this text that so many of us, including myself, have spent our faith journey flipping past and see it speak to us today. God listens when people suffer. God takes up the cause of oppressed people and opposes the proud. What kinds of problems do pride and family conflicts create today? I mean, we've listed some in the church history going back through generations. But if we look at the church today and we look at what the prophet is telling us, we can start to see that we are called to be agents of reconciliation. We are called to try to overcome differences 
and try to bring the family of faith together. The Apostle Paul addressed the same kind of family division in the first century when he wrote in 1 Corinthians 12, 12, just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. We, we face differences, not only within the wider church, writ large, but within our own family of Christ followers. You know, I'm not going to ask uh, for a show of hands of the number of people who have become a part of this church from another church. But that's, we so often divide instead of grow. We so often seek greener pastures instead of reconciliation. We so often look to separate ourselves from those with whom we have conflict rather than listening and setting aside our pride and going to try to overcome differences. And to this, Obadiah says, God is here. God is in our midst. God is in the center of any differences we have. Though the body of Christ will have differences, Obadiah says, your proud heart has deceived you. And then the prophet connects with this overall theme of unity and the body of believers and seeking humility as we grow together. Like other prophets, Obadiah, Obadiah gives a warning. And that we heard in our reading this morning in verse 4, from here, from there, from where you are, I will bring you down, says the Lord. Seeking reconciliation and overcoming differences doesn't always work. I wrote that open letter to the other pastors, and, um, <laughs> and it got a laugh at my naivety. Uh, after briefly listening to my case that as Baptists we acknowledge the priesthood of all believers and the autonomy of the local church, these other pastors, my, my colleagues, the people who I imagined would be my friends in ministry, decided to ignore my suggestion and voted to adopt that document. They ignored a call for inclusion. They ignored a call to respect the autonomy of the local body of believers. They ignored our own tradition. And that's okay. Because I felt like throughout that whole experience, I was doing what God called me to do. And the beauty of it is, you can too. You can do that every single day. You can take these words of the prophet, hold them up in the light of Christ, and seek to follow them as agents of reconciliation. You can take these words of challenge, these words of warning, these words that can be hard, and hold them up. And when all else fails, remember Matthew 6.34, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has worries enough of its own. God's got this. God is present. God is active in people's lives. The warning from the prophet isn't the end. We have the opportunity to be part of God's present and future. We can act for reconciliation. We can overcome some differences and bring people together. We can be who God wants us to be. Read this short book. Soak it in. Let it speak to you. Get to know Obadiah, and as you know, as you do, you will get to know God better. Amen.
From the words of the minor prophet, we come to gather around the table of our Lord, and we gather around this table as a reminder of to whom we belong. We belong to the Lord. And so we gather, just as Jesus gathered with his disciples on the night that he was betrayed, when he took the bread and he broke it, gave thanks for it, and said, whenever you eat this, do it in remembrance of me. This, this bread, this reminds us of the life Jesus lived. It reminds us of the lessons that he taught. It reminds us that even though we don't know the answers, we follow a savior who does. And so we take this bread as participants in this life of faith. Likewise, after the meal, Jesus took the cup and having given thanks for it, said, this is the cup of everlasting life. Whenever you drink this cup, Drink it in remembrance of me. And so we gather around this table saying that we know that we have new life in Christ. We know that we are reconciled to God through the wine. And so we come together to be united in that body and blood. We practice our Lord's Supper by a version of intinction where you come forward and we have little pieces of bread and little cups for the juice. You are invited. This is a table that is open to all. All who profess Christ and have accepted him are welcome here. And so you come as you feel led and you eat the elements as you feel led. Come, be served at the table of our Lord.
pray. God, having nourished us at your holy table, give us strength for the journey. Help us take to heart the message of our gospel lesson and not worry about what's tomorrow, but to live in faith in you, to hear the words of the prophet and seek to live out your calling. Lord, now prepare us for the calling you've got before us. Amen. We have the opportunity to respond to God however you've heard the voice of the divine in this time. If you are here and you're wanting to be a part of this family of faith, we would love to welcome you in. If you're here and would like to make a profession of faith in Christ or seek baptism, we would love to celebrate that with you. If you're here and feeling like God might be saying something to you in ministry, we would love to pray about that and discern with you. Whatever God is saying to you, you can respond. For many of us, that calling today might be to go from this place and to take to heart that invitation to be an agent of reconciliation, to live out that calling in our life of faith. Whatever God is saying to you, this is your chance to respond as you feel led. Our hymn of response is, Take My Life. Let's stand and sing together. Many of you have had the blessing of getting to know Kevin Adams. He's been attending our church for a while now, uh, and he is the head of chaplaincy across the street at the hospital over there, that big bunch of buildings. And so he has a ton of responsibilities at work, and he's also been an ordained minister and served in different capacities in his career in ministry, which is a little longer than my 20. Just a little, okay. <laughs> I've really, really enjoyed getting to know Kevin. He's coming to join with us today by statement of faith to make this church his church. If this blesses you, please say amen. amen. As we listen to the postlude in a moment, uh, Lily it will be his deacon standing with him. I would like to invite all of you to come up and tell, introduce yourself to Kevin if you haven't met him before and tell him how happy you are that he's chosen to make this church his church. Now, as we go from this place, walk in constant awareness of Christ, just as Jesus walked on this earth in constant awareness of God in heaven. Amen. Go in peace.